Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Cannabis Seeds Are Federally Legal. What now? My name is Eric Sandy, and I'm the digital editor of Cannabis Business Times. In early 2022, the DEA sent a reply letter to an inquiry by Vicente Cedarberg's Shane Pennington, who I'll be introducing more thoroughly in a moment, clarifying that cannabis seeds, which contain less than 0.3% THC on a dry weight basis, are in fact legal under the 2018 Farm Bill. The news was considered a surprising yet tepid win for the industry where licensed growers and breeders have faced difficulties selling and acquiring genetics under stringent regulations in some states and a don't ask, don't tell policy in others, all while selling seeds to the public for home growing that was allowed under certain state legal cannabis programs. So we've got a mixed bag out there. We're going to dive into that. The DEA's letter has created a, a state and federal disconnect, which is nothing new for the industry, but this is a particularly different kind of disconnect with the legality of non-licensed cannabis growers or breeders selling seeds under state legal cannabis programs now in question, sowing confusion over whether state or federal law takes precedent here and questioning how to move forward with cannabis genetics under yet another murky regulatory environment. So we're here today to try to clear some of that up. On our panel today, I'm very pleased to welcome Shane Pennington, counsel at Vicente Cedarburg. Shane focuses his practice on federal appeals and regulatory issues relating to cannabis and hemp. And Shane also advises clients on federal psychedelics law, including DEA regulations governing the registration to handle Schedule I psychedelic substances under the Controlled Substances Act and efforts to reschedule or deschedule. Jay Wexler is a professor of law at Boston University. He teaches constitutional law and cannabis law. And Jay is the author of seven books, including the forthcoming Weed Rules, Blazing the Way to a Just and Joyous Marijuana Policy, which will be available from University of California Press in April. So make a note of that. We've also got Rick Campanella, AKA Mr. Soul, the original breeder and CEO of Brothers Grimm Seeds. Rick is best known for creating the famous Cinderella 99 strain, as well as Rosetta Stone, Apollo 11, and more recently, Grimm Glue. Rick first began cultivating and breeding cannabis in 1986 during the days of prohibition, while he worked as a nuclear engineer by day. And since 2015, Rick has devoted himself exclusively to the feminization breeding model to produce stable seed stock for home growers and commercial farms. His lectures on feminized breeding can be found all over YouTube. So search for him there. <laughs> Lastly, we've got Tom Wilson, the owner of Money Tree Genetics. Tom's history with cannabis dates back to the early 90s, at which point the plant quickly became a passion, leading him to having more than 25 years of legacy hands-on experience with cultivation and related industry business aspects. In recent years, his focus has been narrowed to the genetics field of cannabis, encompassing both retail and B2B solutions. And of course, the recently opened brick and mortar genetics store, Money Tree Genetics in Chicago. Before we get going, just a few more notes. You'll see at the bottom of your screen, a Q&A button. So along the way, if you click that button, that'll open the Q&A box. Feel free to type in your questions to any of the panelists as we get going. I'm going to kind of organically insert them into our conversation, but we're also going to have a full Q&A period at the end of this conversation as well. And we'll try to get to as many questions as possible. Also, just know that we are recording today and uh, we will be sending a copy of the recorded video to all registrants via email in the coming days. Lastly, if you enjoy this presentation, get ready for more in-depth education of a similar tone at Cannabis Conference 2023. This is Cannabis Business Time's seventh annual conference based out in Las Vegas, and it will be taking place August 15th to the 17th. You can learn more at CannabisConference.com. And since we're so thrilled to have you here today, I would like to extend a 10% discount to each of you in the audience. Just use the code SEEDS, that's S-E-E-D-S, -E -E when you sign up for the conference. Registration will open tomorrow, February 2nd, over at CannabisConference.com. All right. Let's get into this conversation. We have a lot to cover and a lot of questions to attempt to answer. Uh, Shane, I'd like to begin with you and I'd like to sort of cycle back the calendar about a year. Um, can you describe your role in the DEA's official determination in early 2022, referencing the legality of seeds? You know, what brought it about uh, and what prompted you to pursue this communication with the DEA? Sure. Um, thanks for having me, Eric, and I'm glad to be with everybody on the panel and to all those out there who we can't see. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, yeah, so I um, had arrived at 
uh, Vicente Cedarberg after being at a big firm for a long time and decided to focus on sort of cannabis reform and litigation uh, exclusively. Um, and I was, you know, trying to do something to show my uh, value, I guess. Um, I hadn't really accomplished a whole lot by, at, at that particular point. And, um, and so I guess people didn't really uh, respect me that much yet. And I was arguing with a lot of folks, both in the firm and outside of the firm, clients and all friends and everybody about, you know, they would talk to me about this issue. And I would insist to them, I didn't understand why folks weren't selling seeds, because after the 2018 Farm Bill redefined uh, hemp and excluded it from the Controlled Substances Act coverage, uh, that obviously to me, as a very nerdy lawyer keeping up with this stuff, um, excluded seeds, genetic materials, et cetera, from the list of controlled substances. But whenever I would tell people that, they would, you know, look at me funny and and then argue with me uh, a lot. And I was convinced I was right. And I was looking for a way to prove it, you know, that didn't just rely on me saying I am right. Um, and so um, I just decided to uh, look into, you know, what was the likelihood that DEA would, would be willing to weigh in. And it turns out on their website, they have, if you go to the list of controlled substances on Diversion Control's website, they have a little prefatory warning there, which is very important. And it says, this is the list of controlled substances, right? However, it's not the full list. And just because something's not listed here doesn't mean it's not controlled and you won't go to jail forever for having it or et cetera. If you want to know if a particular substance is or is not controlled, you can write to the following address at Diversion Control and get an, and this is a quote, an official determination from FDA, I'm sorry, from DEA uh, regarding the control status of any particular material. And I was like, oh, that's, that's handy. So I went and wrote a two sentence letter signed Shane sent it and sure enough what do you know uh I forget maybe it was two to four months two months two months later I got a official determination from DEA saying yeah you're right uh none of that stuff is controlled and then I published it on uh a sub stack that I do with a colleague of mine Matt Zorn it's uh on drugs.substack and uh I published this like the source rules dead. Here's this letter, and um, it's by far and away the most read thing of everything that we've written. And it was also like the simplest and sort of like least exciting from our perspective. But I'm glad that people have gotten some mileage out of it. <laughs> Absolutely, and, and just real quick, um, could you maybe, I guess, clarify that term "official determination" as opposed to um, something? legally stronger than that. I, I you know, I, there's a, a temptation to use different words here, but what does official determination really mean? Really great question. I meant to, meant to circle back to that. So I'm glad you asked. Um, so agencies often issue, well, let me back up. Agencies communicate with the regulated communities like in various different ways, some more formal than others, right? So they can promulgate you know, a regulation that is in the federal register and in the code of federal regulations, and it goes through notice and comment or even more formal processes. And then it's basically like a statute. And the only way to change it is to go through a similarly formal process, unless there's a legislation or something. But far more often, that takes a lot of resources, et cetera. So agencies tend to um, not do that unless they have to, for one thing. And, and, also, there's just a lot to do, and a, a lot of people asking them a lot of questions. And so for various reasons, um, they often just answer questions in less formal ways. When they do, you know, sometimes they end up changing their mind later. People get very upset by that. They relied on what's called agency guidance or, you know, their, what their lawyer told them the agency said in the latest bulletin that went around or whatever. And then it then they make business decisions that turn out not to pan out. And that is a pro problem for them because you can't rely on agency guide. Um, I'm sorry, an agency isn't bound by these less formal uh, statements that they make, um, generally speaking, in court. So you, you, know, you rely on it sort of at your own risk. Now, 
people still want the agencies to do that so that they can get the information, right? You'd rather know what the agency's thinking than have no, go be flying completely blind. So there's this balance that we're always striking between giving the public information from the agencies that regulate them versus, you know, exposing ourselves to judicial review and spending a ton of resources, et cetera. The reason that this official determination is significant or particularly significant is because DEA has held it out as its official determination. Um, and by doing that, it has invited public reliance on it. And in doing so, it is all but certain that the agency would be bound by this um, in court unless and until it were to say otherwise. This isn't just some sort of informal guidance. Um, and I could go into all the legal reasons why, but that's really boring. The point is, it's it's not just them. It's not a whisper in the halls of DEA or something. It's not just a letter that they wrote to me. It is their official determination, and you can take it to the bank unless and until they change it through some sort of process, or yeah. or Congress changes it, of course. Yeah, and as you mentioned, it, it certainly does invite public reliance on on this determination. So. Um, if only all of this were as simple as, as just that answer, but we're about to dig into some of the, the nuances here. Um, I want to turn to, to Tom here um, and Money Tree Genetics in Chicago, uh, who in, in stories with Canvas Business Times and elsewhere has, has cited this DEA official determination as, uh, a, you know, alongside the opening of, of your business, uh, which is a genetics, gene a brick and mortar genetics bank. Um, Tom, could you... Uh, maybe elaborate a bit on how this DEA official determination plays into your business plan and what some of your thought process was in mid, mid to late 2022. So, yeah, I mean, leading up to 22 with the hemp farm bill, you know, we were dabbling with the idea and trying to figure out a, you know, a working model that was going to, you know, be successful without falling into this loophole gray area. And there was no, there was no verbiage. And so Shane's, you know, the response he got from the DEA in that letter, that really was our determining factor to go ahead and move forward and open up a brick and mortar. Prior to that, we were looking, you know, to find, you know, either a dispensary license or cultivator's license, something to get us that legality to move forward, except that was all just very unobtainable here in Illinois at the time. All the extra licenses are tied up in litigation and lawsuits, this, that, and the other. And so there really wasn't anything for us. Illinois is early. We don't have any type of uh, nursery license or a breeder's license yet like any other states. And so that's where we're kind of actually talking with the Department of Agriculture, you know, here as much as we can to see if we can formulate some sort of system for us. But uh, once we realized, you know, that response from the DEA, thanks to Shane, that really was it right there. That, that's what we're going on 100%. I, I'm a true believer that, you know, the federal level at that point supersedes, you know, anything that our state says at this point. I think it'll trickle down and I think the state will change its verbiage in the near future. Yeah, sort of along, along those lines, have you received any confused regulatory pushback? <clears throat> I know a lot of a lot of what we're talking about here is, is kind of playing offense as business owners, but implicit in the cannabis industry is is a bit of defense that you have to play against against some some corners as well absolutely um we wanted to essentially test the waters before cannabis business times actually released you know the recent article with the focus on us uh to be prepared for these things so uh we kind of invited local law enforcement in first uh you know chicago police has what they call business officers which are assigned to working with local businesses in that precinct. And so they came in and they were very eager to be educated. Uh, they told us a story within 30 seconds of walking in that they had been ordered to go to another uh, hydroponic supply store that's local and order them to stop selling seeds you know, uh, recently as eight months ago. So they wanted to be educated. So of course we did our due diligence and we literally handed them a copy of the, the Pennington letter and all the verbiage from the Department of Agriculture, from uh, you know federal, state, and made it clear that hey, this isn't our interpretation anymore. This is printouts from various sources. So please, you know, educate yourself. And later that day, maybe three, four hours, I received a phone call from the Department of Agriculture, who told me they received a phone call from the state police. And so clearly, those business officers wanted to confirm the things we were discussing with them 
So clearly they called the state police, the state police called the Department of Agriculture. The only thing they found out of anything that they nitpicked was the Department of Agriculture asked us to remove their logo from our website because they don't endorse anybody. They said we could happily link back to them because we hold licenses, but they just couldn't approve their logo to be on our site. And that is the only pushback I have received thus far. That's nothing. Gotcha. Well, and that's certainly, um, that's one example of, of one uh, or a number of state agencies in one state. Uh, and we're going to be sort of circling this, this question of federal and state law, which takes precedence over which. It's kind of a, a theme in cannabis and we're kind of flipping it on its head here where the, the feds are maybe a bit more permissive in some ways in this case, states may or may not be. I know there are a few questions already getting into uh, from the audience, I mean, about the question of federal and state law, and we'll be we'll be getting there in, in short order. But I want to move from that state example to more of a federal example uh, with Rick and, and Brothers Grimm Seeds. Um, not long ago, of course, Brothers Grimm was cleared after a U.S. Postal Service investigation into their seed sales um, across state lines. This is something that I'd imagine a number of our audience members are familiar with, whether they're on the selling or buying side of, of that seed transaction. Uh, Rick, could you sort of uh, describe what happened there and, and what the USPS, yeah. uh, what, what their stance was? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's a uh, similar story to Tom's where an agency uh, was uh, interacting with us vis-a-vis uh, -vis post US Postal Service had stopped our packages that were en route to clients who had bought seeds from our website in several states. My wife oversees the shipping and uh, order fulfillment on the website, so she heard from enough people over a short enough time, it was about a two to three week period of time that she amassed several people complaining that they hadn't received their packages and that they had received a note saying that the package was being held for some reason, uh, you know, technical reasons at the post office, uh, not always the same reason. So she called around to the USPS uh, responsible parties and told them that uh, we are cu curious uh, to know why our packages are being stopped. And they said, well, it's uh, marijuana and it's not allowed to be, you know, sent in the mail or whatever. And so she said, now uh, inside the package, we have certificates of um, analysis that show that these are hemp products, they're seeds that rate less than 0.3% THC. And the DEA has an official statement that is available to the public that states the seeds are considered hemp. They only then requested that, well, could you provide us those documents? And once we review that, um, we'll give you our determination. And they called back, I believe it was even the same day to say, you're whitelisted from now on, we won't stop any more of your packages. We're gonna communicate that throughout the USPS and uh, Brothers Grimm packages won't be interfered with because you know there's no issue. Uh, you've provided documentation that everything is above boards there. And uh, it was a coincidence, I, I can't help mentioning this, uh, maybe tangential, but I put out a video at the beginning of 2022 where I sat before the camera and just for the purposes of allaying the fears of any potential clients on our website, I said, uh, seeds are definitely legal. Uh, they, are, they are hemp uh, because a seed has less than 0.3% THC. And regardless of whether that seed grows later into a THC bearing plant or not, it's still hemp as a seed, because hemp is defined as any part of the cannabis plant that has 0.3% THC or less. And so therefore, it's clearly hemp today. And we really can't define something by what it might be in the future under certain conditions, or else, you know, the whole world would go uh, haywire. We'd have uh, farmers selling eggs at the price of a chicken because they figure, you know, hey, this is potentially a chicken. I, I need to get the price of a chicken for this egg. And that's just ridiculous. So it's one of those stories of uh, as a seed, it's hemp. And therefore, um, when I explained that in my video, you know, it was a lot more concise than what I'm doing now, which is kind of rambling, but uh, I made it clear. And then I had no idea that the DEA had already put out that statement or Maybe they hadn't yet, but it was like two weeks after I had put my video on YouTube, I get a feed on Instagram where 
there's a, a meme that came up or a, a, an announcement, that official announcement from the DEA that seeds are hemp. And I was like, look at that, you know, I'm proved right. You know, I only, it was only like two weeks after I made my video. <laughs> and it was, perhaps I was completely ignorant and they had already said that and I just hadn't seen it yet. But it was funny because it was like, we were on the same wavelength thinking the same thing at the same time. Certainly very timely. And uh, I'm, I'm gonna jump in with a question from the audience here. And we've had a number of fantastic ones already. But of course, Rick, you know that, that story intersects with the USPS, which, which is a yeah. federal agency. Uh, we have a question here just regarding, the question is, are there any states you would avoid shipping to? And I might no. rephrase that to say, are there any um, states that have policies about growers receiving seeds from out of state that you know of? No, and if they were to question uh, any package that we were sending to somebody in the state, whether they have uh, legal cannabis in that state or not, it's still a hemp product, which I believe is federally acceptable. And, uh, and the USPS sees it as something that they're not going to try to intercept, you know, for reasons of transporting across state lines, uh, something that shouldn't be transported across state lines, you know. so. I think the answer to that question is, you know, two parts. Uh, our policy, for Brothers Grimm, is to not restrict our sales or or shipments to any state that we we are uh, sending to every of every state in the United States. We just don't send outside the United States. Nothing to Europe or Canada or Mexico or anything else. So it's U.S. only, and uh, we don't see any problems with that. Um, and as I say, you know, the second half of the question is on the receiving end. If someone were to have their package stopped, I mean, we've had great success already in resolving that by a telephone call to the post office and the customer gets his package. Absolutely. Um, we also have a number of audience members chiming in with specific definitions of cannabis from, from state to state. And we've got a number of examples here in our notes on the, on the panel. And, and it's true, you know, states do define cannabis differently and, and some defer to the 2018 farm bills definition of hemp to sort of set seeds and other aspects of the plant aside. Um, other states do not and they lump seeds right into that definition of cannabis, um, which falls under that state's regulatory agency. So we quickly find ourselves in this sort of stew of state and federal tension. Um, I wanted to turn to Jay who, Again, like I mentioned at the top of the hour, not only has a, a book coming out with, uh, with the words just and joyful marijuana policy in, in the title, um, but, but teaches cannabis law. Um, Jay, can you help us kind of square this tension a bit um, for, for licensed growers out there? And, and I'm gonna make a leap and say the bulk of the audience falls into the licensed grower, retailer or breeder segment. Um, what should they be, Taking, not only taking away from this conversation, but what should they be thinking about when it comes to sourcing seeds? Uh, well, thank you. Thank you for uh, including me in this uh, fabulous panel and thanks to everybody for, for coming. Um, it's, uh, it's such a, a fascinating and complicated question, this relationship between the federal law and the state law when it comes to cannabis. And this, uh, as you pointed out already, poses a somewhat unique kind of situation where you might have the federal government uh, being more lenient than the state governments. And so um, the, I guess what I would say is that um, when you're evaluating the effectiveness of a state law uh, that seems to be in, inconsistent with or intention with, with a federal law, there are really two questions you have to ask about whether uh, when, when, you're, when you're considering whether the state law is effective. Uh, and here, here we have to assume we're, maybe we're talking about a state where there is, where the definition of, of cannabis includes the seeds and there's a restriction on interstate commerce of cannabis so that there is restriction on the interstate commerce of seeds. And, then, and so the question is, how do we square that with the federal uh, determination that seeds are hemp? Uh, so one question, the first question is, is, does the federal law preempt the state law? In other words, does the federal law by its terms, uh, either explicitly or implicitly, render null, uh, render a nullity the state law that seems to be in tension uh, with it? And then the second question is, if there is not preemption, if the federal law does not preempt the state law, is the state law, nonetheless, does it violate some other constitutional limit that's out there to protect other entities or other indiv individuals, corporations, or states, which is the important part here, because if, if it's true that a state 
uh, is uh, that a state's definition of cannabis results in, uh, in, the, in the inability to export or import seeds, then there's a potential dormant commerce clause problem. And, uh, and so, so we will have to get into that and I know Shane's gonna talk about that uh, uh, at, uh, at, at some point soon. But, but, to, but on the preemption question, right? So I said, first, the question is, is there federal preemption of state law? And then second, does the state law violate some independent constitutional concern like the dormant commerce clause? On the preemption part, I think there's no uh, argument that the federal law is preempting the state law here. Uh, there's nothing, uh, in fact, the only only Congress can preempt state law, and so and here we don't even have a congressional determination about uh, the definition of seeds. We just we, we have the DEA's interpretation, which which is 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 not quite what the court would be looking for to determine if there's any preemption. I don't think there's any strong argument that the federal law, for example, says any any state law that makes export or import uh, of seeds illegal is uh, is preempted. So uh, uh, preemption is a very complicated and dull uh, legal subject that we really want to spend as little time as possible in. Uh, we can if people want to pursue it, but, uh, but I'll just leave it there. There's no really good argument for preemption. So the question is, does, might the state law restriction on import and export of seeds uh, uh, run into a dormant commerce clause problem? We'll yeah, see where you I, want to take it from there. No, I think uh, I'm glad that phrase has come up, um, the dormant commerce clause. I think it's something that if you're in the cannabis industry and, and maybe you haven't heard that phrase, uh, you're going to hear it a lot in the, in the coming months and years. And, and certainly we're going to get into it now this, at this moment. Um, just this morning, I was writing a story uh, on a lawsuit out of New York State regarding the dormant commerce clause and the issuance of adult use dispensary licenses. So this takes many shapes in cannabis. Uh, for our purposes, I do wanna turn to Shane here. Um, if you could sort of pick up that thread that, that Jay began, can you elaborate on the dormant commerce clause? And um, I realize this, can, this could turn into a law lecture very quickly. So, um, but for the purposes of, of, our, of our licensed grower, licensed retailer audience, what does this mean and what should growers and, and retailers know about this? It, if it's okay, I'd like to either answer that first and then address something else or, or reverse because I was in the Q&A for a long time and missed half of what everyone was saying while I was batting away questions. And I feel like I should just make a kind of blanket statement based on what I'm seeing. Like, sure. like warning, everyone listen, everybody listen to this. If you're asking questions about, is this legal, you know, can I do this, can I do that, in the chat of this call, you are doing the right thing because you have some really informed people. On the other hand, none of us are in a lawyer-client relationship with you, and we could just say something wrong or not know what we're talking about, and that would be, that would be not good for you to rely on that. So if you are thinking of relying on something and you really need an answer, Hire a good lawyer and get an engagement agreement. That way, if they commit malpractice, you can hire another lawyer and sue them. Um, and that leads me to a second very important warning, which is the fact that DEA has said, even officially, that something is not a controlled substance under the Federal Drug Abuse Prevention and Control Act of 1970, also uh, known as the Controlled Substances Act, does not mean that see the Customs and Border Protection, FDA, OSHA, UPS, the IRS, your Aunt Marcy or whomever agrees with that, nor does it mean states agree with that. It doesn't mean the drug sniffer dog isn't going to, you know, uh, bark when you walk by. So all that to say, and even if even if later you were able to litigate something like that and and get out from under whatever kind of enforcement action might unfortunately befall you um it you need to know that that might take a lot of time in other words even if an agency's wrong if they have enforcement powers they can they they sometimes make mistakes and enforce when they're wrong and that can put you through a lot of hell so again hire a lawyer please um i've been trying to give as much advice as i can in the comments section but it's i can only do so much and so anyway okay now dormant commerce clause just real quick basically um, the federal government wants folks to have uh, to engage in interstate commerce. And so, you know, they want like a robust economy with people trading goods and services for things of value, blah, blah, blah. So what they don't want is to have one state saying, OK, 
you can buy our apples and you can, you know, sell our apples in our state, but you can't buy those Washington apples because those Washington apples, uh, we just don't like them here in California, for example. Keep them out of here. Now, that sort of protectionist measure is something that the framers of the Constitution, you know, maybe they had that in their head because they didn't want um, they didn't want states like protecting their markets at the expense of interstate commerce. In other words, they didn't want in-stater regulators discriminating against out-of-state products and services. Okay. Now, this isn't actually written in the Constitution, but courts have, have read it to, to be part of it by sort of implication, except for Justice Thomas. Uh, God, God bless him. So that means that for now, if one of these seed laws, right, so people have been quoting these laws that said define cannabis, right, as to include seeds. And the question is, okay, well, um, if the state law says that, but now DEA said otherwise, who wins and how does that work? Well, as uh, Jay said, the, the first level answer is the state can basically prohibit stuff, even if the feds don't, as just a general matter. Um, and so states are free to prohibit seeds. What they're not free to do under the Dormant Commerce Clause is say only our seeds. So if that definition of cannabis seeds says, and cannabis is defined as seeds <clears throat> that are licensed under the state system and grown here and have the seal of approval of the governor and whatever, right? Because that would mean that then often, often that, that means that you can't bring seeds from out of state and you can't, you know, uh, they're trying to basically limit competition for their market to protect California or New York or whatever it may be. And that's where the dormant commerce clause comes in. And if a state law like overtly discriminates against out of state commerce, meaning it says, you know, no seeds from out of state, only the in-state seeds are, are, uh, are eligible for um, commerce. That is going to be pretty much a, a layup unconstitutional if it's challenged in court. Um, Sometimes there's indirect discrimination and that gets more complicated. And the last thing that I'll say uh, on this is the Supreme Court's looking at this doctrine right now and is you know, in a court case that's coming out of California and might say more about it. And the, um, I would like to ask Professor Wexler uh, what kind of grade I got on my exam there because he, he said I would talk about it, but he's the smartest guy in the room, so. Uh, Any red pen? <laughs> I mean, I, uh, yeah, no, I mean, everything you said is correct. Uh, and I, I, A plus, I think, uh, although I'm on sabbatical. So the greatest thing about being on sabbatical is I don't have to grade anything. Um, but I, I want to add a couple quick things on the Dormant Commerce Clause uh, issue. There's been this assumption ever since states started legalizing that the Dormant Commerce Clause uh, does not apply to cannabis because it's cannabis is federally illegal. Um, and, and so states from the very beginning did all sorts of things, uh, which if they were done in a different industry would be absolutely clearly patently unconstitutional. Like for example, saying uh, you have to have a residence uh, in Maine for so long before you can get a license in Maine, or also that you can't export or import cannabis, right? If this was anything other than cannabis, if it was lobsters or apples or services of any kind, it would be absolutely unquestionable that, that such a restriction would violate the, the Dormant Commerce Clause. And so there's a very strong argument that this goes beyond seeds. There's one, one way in which the seeds point is, is, uh, is, very, is, is different and which I'll hope, hopefully get to, but there is definitely a very strong argument and the argument is getting stronger and stronger um, as, as we see decisions coming down most recently from the First Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, last year, which are basically saying just because it, it's cannabis is federally illegal doesn't mean that the Dormant Commerce Clause doesn't apply to restrict states' ability to protect their own, uh, you know, to, to, re, to, to reject states' efforts to protect their own industries. And so there's a case, there's a, I believe there's a, a complaint now in Oregon. Um, I don't know if anybody, I mean, I was looking, looking through this uh, this morning, Jefferson <laughs> Packing House versus Brown, is that uh, uh, and that case is basically saying, going all the way, as far as I can tell, and saying interstate states can't restrict in the interstate commerce of cannabis just because it's federally Ill, uh, illegal. Now, here's the other, and, and I think that's a very strong argument, and it could, in fact, it win, uh, and that, which will change the face of everything. Um, pending maybe Supreme Court review, but there's one. But the the last point I'll make is that there is 
this this I, this issue of whether the dormant commerce clause applies when there's a federal ban on a substance. Um, I think the right answer is that the dormant commerce clause does apply. But there is a plausible argument on the other side that because they, because there's federal illegality, therefore the dormant commerce clause does not apply. And uh, the dissent in the First Circuit Court of Appeals said that. And that's a plausible argument, but it completely falls away in the seeds context once the DEA says that seeds are hemp. So in other words, there's a really strong argument that all state restrictions on interstate commerce on, uh, on marijuana are unconstitutional. And there's an even better argument with respect to seeds. And so uh, hopefully <laughs> so Shane will bring this case and, and we'll get closer to, to, to interstate commerce. And, uh, and, and well, that's, I hope that happens, but that's different. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's all about preventing a monopoly. Nobody used the word monopoly, but the whole time when you two lawyers were talking, I'm thinking like, it's like stopping them from having a monopoly, <laughs> you know, because when they have these situations, they have these organizations like metric or a system of legalization within which uh, everyone has to comply in a state. Uh, one of them is called metric. And I believe in metric that you can't import seeds from outside the state. You have to have them uh, sourced from within the state from some, a, a qualified uh, source within their system. And that creates a monopoly for anyone who's making seeds or selling seeds in their state. But I believe that an argument could be uh, you know, offered where you know, there is no other reason for that law preventing seeds coming in and out over the state border that is in any way there to support some reason that the, you know, the, the people of the state would be harmed or injured in any way by that. And on the contrary, you may be preventing some life-saving new strain of marijuana from being imported in because the seeds aren't allowed to cross the border. Therefore, it kind of trumps the very idea that, you know, hey, we work on an old boy system here in our state and we wanted just these guys to be the seed guys and then to make all the money. That, that, that argument would be, you know, very transparently uh, Machiavellian. So I would think that anybody could argue a way that, hey, that rule, really, we shouldn't have that inside of a metric system or any other system that regulates the growing and uh, the commerce of uh, marijuana within a state, because it's clearly there for the reasons of uh, lining the pockets of the people who are the operatives within their state, and therefore this uh, uh, dormant co uh, commerce clause would come into effect, I should think. And you're showing that, hey, the only reason you have this rule is to keep your own cronies in money. Uh, and you're preventing benefits to the uh, constituents of your district here. So yeah. I'm now a lawyer, but it seems to make sense to me that you should look at it that way. Can I add one thing on that? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think a state might uh, plausibly you know, re respond, hey, when we first set up the system saying that all seeds and all uh, cannabis halves would be from within the state and we can't export or import it. That the reason why they did that was uh, to, to keep the feds you know, from, from, from targeting them, from looking at them and basically saying, you know, we're not doing anything you know, with interstate commerce, so, so feds stay away from us kind of was, was to be careful uh, given the uncertainty about how federal enforcement might, uh, might apply. But that, even if that you bought that argument generally, it no longer works for the seeds, because now the DEA has said, right, in the letter that seeds are not hemp. So no state has to worry that the federal government is going to come after them yeah. for importing or exporting seeds. So that the only plausible argument in favor of the protectionist legislation with respect to seeds has fallen away, I think. And that makes the dormant commerce, commerce clause <laughs> argument even stronger. Thanks for addressing that. And someone, while you were talking, flashed across my screen saying that metric, at least in their state, it seems, does allow them now to import seeds from outside the state. I can't verify that that's true, but I did see that blurb cross my screen here from one of our um, uh, listeners. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, fantastic questions from the audience. And I'm gonna be trying to circle around to them as we continue here. One of those questions uh, that's come up quite often has to do with, with tissue culture uh, or clones, which, which are also mentioned in the letter from the DEA to, to Shane. And I wanted to maybe, uh, we can certainly all uh, go around the horn here on this, but I wanted to turn to Tom and, and Money Tree Genetics. Um, 
you know, we've been talking a lot about seed and seed sales, um, but but clones have a place here too. Um, could you maybe elaborate on that and, and talk about uh, how clones might intersect with your own business? Yeah, I, you know, we kind of, with, with our model, we wanted to formulate something with clones that would pretty much replicate seeds, the same type of testing, same type of falling under the 0.3. So for us, it was really shoring up uh, supply chain from, you know, certified vendors, licensed facilities that are keeping track of their stock, have tests, paperwork that come with everything, showing all the, you know, all the prudent information that might be needed, whether it's somebody from the UPS that's opening it up and looking at it, or somebody walking into our store and looking at it. Everything kind of coincides, you know, with our legal board. And I think there's almost as much interest these days in live genetics and tissue cultures as there is seeds. And so it's definitely part of, you know, of, of our model here and uh, seems to be going well. Um, you know, I'd like to chime, you know, I feel like all the concerns, you know, that people have with metrics and everything, at least here in Illinois, it doesn't feel like it's being upheld very much. I see a lot of these strains that are in these cultivation centers. And I personally know they weren't bred here. They weren't made here. They weren't they didn't come in on anybody's metrics. They didn't meet their guidelines. And I think the Department of Agriculture has realized that. And so I think, you know, being the first or what I believe is the first, you know, truly dedicated, you know, genetics and clone seed bank here. I think that's kind of maybe the, the in-between place for transparency to have a third party that can keep track of where genetics are coming from, tie them, you know, to batch numbers or what have you and be able to provide that service to whether it's an individual consumer over the counter or a cultivation center or facility that intends to put that products on the shelves. I think, you know, having that in place is going to actually solve a lot of these problems or at least make it a lot easier to deal with and for uh, questions to be answered. Yeah. Could you, um, on the clone side of things, I mean, seeds are one thing, but on the clone side, could you maybe elaborate on on that 0.3% THC threshold, um, how that is either managed or communicated to, to potential buyers when it comes to clones? Yeah, we kind of post it everywhere. Most of our customers we know are shopping ahead of time, let's say, doing their research. And so, you know, everything that we document, we kind of explain as much of that verbiage as we can just to have them as familiar as possible. And then for the folks that come in that do not, we educate them, you know, before making any suggestions for sales. And, you know, we actually pull out the paperwork and show them, here's the results, you know, these clones have tested, you know, under this limit. So you are not breaking any laws, leaving our store with them. We're, uh, we're giving you, you know, all the tools needed to educate yourself, to be able to go home, get these things going and not break the rules. Yeah. Um... And I, I guess baked into that um, is, and baked into this whole conversation really is, is the word transparency. And I kind of want to turn to Rick here again. You know, in theory, this official determination uh, 12 months ago from the DEA, at least on paper, um, would open up a more transparent market for seed sales or genetic sales in, in general, uh, across the U.S. at least. Over the past 12 months, have you felt that? Have you felt that things have opened up and, be, and become more transparent between buyers and, and breeders like yourself? You know, yeah, it's hard to tell if it's just our own business, you know, and our model and what we are doing uh, internally uh, that is creating more interest, but it seems like it has snowballed in the last year to where our traffic on our website is like tripled or more. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of home grower, um, uh, purchasers, uh, buyers on our website, and not a huge uh, population of buyers that were in the commercial markets buying tens of thousands of seeds, where in years past they did that more. This past year was for some reason anomaly um, in the sense that it was heavily weighted toward the smaller buyers and the population of them, like I say, tripled, uh, you know, on our data. And that's hard to say that it's our marketing and our interaction with the public on social media or what's causing that or whether that's just the environment out there in the market. 
um, but it could become, I'm sure it's a combination of the two. I know my teams work very hard and I applaud them on everything they've done to increase our visibility on social media. And I believe that um, this year I'm sensing early on uh, that there are big buyers uh, for the, the large bulk seed orders coming back to the table at the beginning of the year and getting ready for the spring. So I think last year may have been anomalous in that sense, but um, yeah, I'm sensing that there is a more uh, uh, more reception, more an openness to receive uh, or purchase seeds without feeling uh, that they're doing something surreptitious, you know. Yeah, um, I'm going to start sort of tilting things into into the future a little bit. We've been talking about the past year and the effects of this letter from the DEA, but yeah. um, but Rick, stay, staying with you and, and the breeder side for a minute. Um, well, what would what would make life easier? I guess what are what are some things that you would like to see make your business easier to engage with uh, when it comes to the open market? I think that uh, mainly it would be uh, the commercial market. Like I said, there's probably a reluctance on the part of the bigger buyers to get their uh, fingers slapped or something. Uh, you know in the sense that they're perhaps a publicly traded company. They have a um, certain image that they want to keep. And if it looks like, hey, you know, these guys were breaking the rules and kind of like going through the back door to obtain genetics or something like that, it might look bad for them. And so I'd like to break away <clears throat> or, or knock away any of those kinds of barriers to the comfortability of our buyer, a commercial buyer to step up to the plate and say, oh, hey, you know, we're running a commercial facility. Our manager would really like to have a perpetually harvested um, cycle where every three weeks or every month or something, they're, they're harvesting X number of plants. Would you be able to contract with us to supply us the seeds where every month or whatever the repeat cycle is, you'll supply us X number of seeds and we'll, we'll have that rotating thing happening. It, <clears throat> I think that that's the model that they'd like to use. I just don't believe that they feel like at any given moment, having an ongoing contract like that with a seed company might put them in some sort of jeopardy. So uh, to answer your question, like what I'd like to see is an assurance from the federal and state governments or an, an agreement that there's a way to interpret the uh, precedence of whether it's federal or state that's going to take precedence in a, in a rule, uh, be cleared away and commercial concerns are made aware that, look, you guys, uh, if there's a company that sells seeds in any state here uh, and you like what they're, what they're doing and you want their products, we're not going to stand in the way of you getting them. Something like that. You know, I, I think that the small buyers are already pretty comfortable buying their little, you know, two or three packs of seeds at a time and growing in their closet or their basement. And, you know, they, it's legal enough for them. Yeah, and I kind of wanted to, to flip that around. Um, that's the breeder side and, and you're already going down this road, Rick, but I, I wanted to put this to both you and, and Tom. Um, what, what do licensed growers want? And I know we have a, a bunch in the audience and, and they can certainly chime in here with, with recommendations of, of policies or, or things they'd like to see. Um, but just from, from your customers, what kind of questions are you getting or what kind of yeah. hopes are you hearing from, from licensed growers? I can sum it up in a few sentences. I mean, essentially, a, a commercial buyer will come to us with a number in their head of the uh, quantity of seeds that they want to obtain. And then they'll ask, can you supply us that number of seeds and can you break it up into lots of different varieties, different strains, if you will, of your, of your seeds? And so they tend to be looking for, like I said, a certain number and they want to have that broken up into as much variety as possible in general. Uh, Tom and I talked earlier about that question and uh, many, many will find that if they bought too big of a variety, they're going to find it like, some percentage of the total mass that they bought is the fast moving sellers and the other ones are a little sleepy and they may then recalibrate next time they order there's going to be a greater number of the varieties that were more popular and less variety across the board but maybe the same number of seeds purchased in the next uh, order but 
It depends on the facility. Yeah. But that's what I see as the character, you know, the how to characterize what would a commercial seed buyer typically ask or want? What are their desires? The other thing is that they're looking for feminized seed that's really feminized because there's been a stigma in the community since the early 2000s when feminized seeds were first sort of being created um, in the dark shadows and corners and basements of, you know, American homes all over the country. And uh, those guys were not, you know, trained scientists and they had a few misconceptions about how to do it. And I was put off from the whole idea of feminizing because of the fact that they tended to just create a lot of hermaphrodites. And so commercial buyers want to say, okay, we'd love to have feminized seeds because there's so many great advantages to starting from seeds that you can be sure that they're going to turn into an actual female plant, but we don't want to run the risk of ruining an entire crop because we missed a few uh, plants that turned out to be hermaphroditic and they pollinated the, and ruined the crop. So if they can be guaranteed that the seeds will produce a real female plant, no hermaphrodites, then that's the other big thing. And that's what we're known for. And then uh, kind of in a similar vein, having any given strain, uh, when they buy a quantity of those seeds, they want them all to grow into plants that are very similar and very much as described on the package, you know, which is only normal. You would expect that, you know, you buy a product has a picture of a plant on it with the, this is what these seeds are supposed to grow into and look like. And then it's described in a verbally on the package that these are the growing characteristics and characteristics that you'll see in this. If they don't all turn out like that, then what are you really selling? Something that's not what you're advertising, right? And so if you have genetics coming from a breeder who really doesn't have his ability to assure uniformity of each seed lot, then they're going to see a lot of variation. They're not going to be happy with that. So they want to avoid those things. They want really feminized seeds. They want uniform crops and they want to have a variety that makes sense, as much variety as makes sense. Absolutely. I'll quickly relay, uh, an, I guess, an answer from one of our audience members here. Licensed growers want good genetics at a good price and comfort that they can import into metric or, or a similar platform right. without getting hassled by their inspector, uh, which, which sounds pretty reasonable to me. Um, so I wanted to, well, put the similar question to Tom and just get a sense of, uh, I guess what demand has looked like over the past few months, what the market in general looks like. I mean, I, I know on Cannabis Business Times, we're reporting a lot on the, the retail segment of the cannabis market and uh, the price compression, and that's a whole other uh, can of worms that we can get into later. But in the seed market, uh, what are things looking like right now? What's, what's moving? What's selling? Um, how has demand evolved maybe in the last year since this letter emerged? So for us, you know, we, uh, we avoid, we skipped altogether going online. So I wasn't doing seed sales or clone sales online prior to this. And we've been open three months now. And what we've seen in three months was the first month and a half was purely the home grower. 80% um, I would have to say were very experienced home growers, very passionate. And the demands that people are asking for, it's kind of been split into two categories. Uh, we see a big trend, people asking for land race for, you know, legacy genetics. Uh, there's a big demand for a lot of the old school OG Kush, original sour diesel, things like that. A lot of people are coming in and asking. And my take on it is it seems like maybe this is from like the 40 year old and up crowd that used to you know not be comfortable going out shopping for genetics. And so nobody heard from these folks before, but now here we are, we have the store, they're comfortable enough to walk in with things being as relaxed as they are. Hey, can you get me this? Hey, can you get me that? And that, that's been a big, uh, a, a big request. The other ones is, you know, the, the concentrate market. Uh, seems like a lot of home growers are doing their home rosin pressing. So that's where we see a shift where the other uh, people walking in are asking for a very high terpene uh, hybrids, all the latest and greatest crosses, because they're looking for these flavor profiles with their concentrates. And so that was about the first six weeks. And then the word got out in the community, all the local dispensaries heard about us. And so local dispensary managers started coming in and checking us out and seeing what we have. And I, you know, there's this authenticity factor, you know, when 
people want to buy your genetics because you carry stuff that interpolate, you know, people on the street know what you have. That's what they want. Clearly, this is the disconnect between dispensaries and the black market. There's a lot of people that would rather spend their money on the black market for a particular strain or from a cultivator line that they're familiar with rather than the dispensary. So now we're talking with dispensary owners and cultivators because like uh, Rick was mentioning, you know, there's a, a need for somebody to curate strains that's going to make it onto the shelves through these cultivation centers and to do like crop rotations and to keep these flavors fresh. And I think they're, they vary from market to market. They're in the Midwest and Chicago, people like, uh, you know, a lot of the real gassy strains, you know, the cookie strains, the, the gelatos, the jet fuels. And so somebody you know, needs to step in and be able to provide those genetics to these cultivation centers. And so uh, we're seeing the need. That's where we'd like to, you know, get some sort of specialized license, you know, like as a breeder, as a nursery, something. Um, but despite not being licensed, everybody's reaching out to us anyways to help obtain these genetics for their cultivation centers because we've decided to track to keep the paperwork and the time to batch numbers and that seems to be enough to get people on board despite us not having you know the cultivation license yet and so uh, i think it's a whole new avenue it's, it's, it's exciting certainly um yeah definitely exciting time in the industry um in, in good ways and bad ways i suppose um I, i'm gonna start turning to audience questions here we have a ton and i will say that we'll make sure that any questions we don't get to we can always connect after the fact um offline so to speak uh, but Jay, I did want to turn to you uh, as well as Shane. Um, but Jay, there are a number of bills in Congress and, and certainly in state houses across the U.S. that may or may not advance some measure of cannabis reform this year. We may see some states come online. We may see something happen in Washington, D.C. I don't think anyone's holding their breath, but, but some of those bills certainly intersect with, with seed sales or even interstate commerce. Uh, we've seen some news out of California that that, that that state is engaging the interstate commerce question and, and feeling their way through that. You know, at the start of this year, I guess we're already in February all of a sudden, but in 2023, what are some either notable bills or policy changes that are on the horizon uh, that, that in the context of this conversation, folks should be familiarizing themselves with? Hmm. Uh, well, so I certainly don't want to engage in kind of predictions. Those are those are dangerous, and especially if you saw uh, how much money I just lost in Vegas. Uh, it was, <laughs> I hesitate to say anything about the, but uh, so I, I, uh, I, I don't know. It'd be interesting to see what, hear what other people think. I think, um, I, I don't think we're gonna see much at the federal level. Uh, I think there's, it's unlikely we're gonna, we'll see some more conversation about uh, some of the more comprehensive federal legislation. But I don't think that uh, that's going anywhere. We, maybe there's a slightly uh, greater chance that we'll see some sort of piecemeal federal legislation uh, get passed. I mean, is the SAFE Act ever going to uh, uh, end up as law? Is there will there be something like the HOPE Act to help with expungement or veterans? I, there's a slightly better chance for that. Um, it's interesting because you have to watch the federal agencies too. You know, it's uh, there are a lot of things to watch when you're when you're monitoring what's uh, the future of uh, cannabis and and the law, anyways. And so you're looking at the federal legislation, but you also have to look at what the federal agencies are doing and whether the Justice Department will sort of get any of its act together um, uh, to to centralize or uniformly. Uh, address some of the issues that are of importance to uh, people here. Will there be anything on the reclassification that the that uh, that, that the, the president uh, you know asked to uh, to look into the agency to look into at the state level? Um, uh, you know, I, I, maybe we'll see Pennsylvania come on. That be that's sort of my uh, uh, what I am excited about. State reforms are all, another thing you have to look at, um, uh, and and then in the courts, I think there's going to be. I think the the courts are becoming more and more interesting, actually, uh, the, uh, certainly in the federal legislature. And a lot of action could, you know, could, uh, this case that I uh, that I mentioned earlier, uh, and some of the other dormant commerce clause cases that are percolating around in New York and elsewhere, could have really fundamental implications for everything having in the market, including seeds. And so it's worth worth looking at courts and judicial decisions. Yay. But but beyond that, I I won't I won't make any other predictions. 
Yeah, uh, and, and understandable. Uh, it's, a, it's a tricky game in this industry. Um, but Shane, I wanted to either put the same question to you and, and see if you might want to flag any, certainly could be uh, civil cases in the courts or, or legislation that, that might be worth pointing to. I also, and, and take that in any direction you'd like, um, and or I, I wonder if, if safe banking is worth touching on here. I don't know if, if that, it certainly opens up a lot of avenues in the industry, broadly speaking, um, but are there any protections that, that breeders or, or seed buyers uh, might glean from safe banking? Feel free to take that very broad question anywhere you'd like. Um, sure. So just to follow up on like what to watch, I mean, I would echo what uh, Jay said. I mean, the reason that I got into this area of law is because it's deliciously complicated, like deeply, deeply complicated. And there are so many fun puzzles and that's what I like. And so I was attracted to it and I definitely got what I bargained for and then some. So for example, a lot of people don't realize the implications of the Supreme Court's overturning of Roe v. Wade for the cannabis conversation. Who has control over medical and health decisions uh, for citizens of the United States? And how does it change when we go from talking about a practice or a service versus uh, a medication or a drug? Um, these are these, I mean, how states and, and DOJ react to state laws, um, you know, banning medicated abortions will have serious implications for the cannabis conversation, particularly medical cannabis that no one's talking about. Um, when Brittany Griner uh, had that whole fiasco, uh, you know, in Russia, um, that has that highlights the international treaty implications that are involved here that are very real. And people like to ignore them because if there's one thing people like to talk about less than preemption, it's the single convention. Um, but I will tell you, if you actually care about or have a stake in this and need to know what's up, then you just simply cannot take headlines and run with them. You really need to dig deep or, or know somebody who's constantly digging deep on it. I mean, that's just a fact. So to give you an example of you know, why you should tell your friends and family that cannabis policy matters. Like, here's another another one that people don't talk about. The opioid uh, crisis is a priority for the Biden administration. And there's a direct connection between the cannabis debate and drug regulation in the United States and our ability or inability to effectively fight, uh, you know, overdoses, fentanyl analogs, like pouring in from Mexico by, by way of China and our ability internationally to um, figure out a way to stem the flow and, and be effective uh, at representing US interests abroad because of what's going on with our domestic cannabis policy. Very few people are thinking about those things. They matter very much. They're going to be playing out in the, in the coming years as far as you know, particular legislation. One that I would keep a look, a look, a, a careful eye on is the Breakthrough Therapies Act. It breaks down something called um, bifurcated scheduling. Um, and it's something that not many people are, are aware of, but it has to do with psilocybin. But the impact of, of you know, sort of um, breaking away from the pharma bifurcated scheduling model, which impacts cannabis, where you have epidiolex is descheduled, even though it's a cannabis derived uh, substance, but synthetic THC is in one schedule. If it's this dosage formulation, blah, 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 that's called bifurcated scheduling. OK, and it's a huge barrier to cannabis reform and the Breakthrough Therapies Act kind of addresses that. And it's too much to get into here, the details, but it's something to keep up with if you're you know, interested in these issues. And I could go on and on and on and on, but I'll just stop there. No, I think uh, I mean, you raise an interesting point that I just want to mention that in the background of this, of course, back in October, uh, the president announced intentions to explore I got a number of things, I guess, but one of them being rescheduling or descheduling cannabis, which um, is not as simple as that phrase even sounds. Um, it gets super complicated. One question that, you know, following that line of, of this is very complicated stuff, I know one person or at least several people in the questions and answers box here have been quoting some some state laws, some state definitions of cannabis. So real quick, I don't know, Shane, is there... um. In terms of, of getting that definition of cannabis changed in a single state, what are some levers that folks could pull? I mean, would that come from a state legislature or a regulatory agency? I know this, the, the answer might be more complicated than that, but if we're interested in opening up that definition of cannabis to maybe free up 
seeds or, or tissue culture in a single state? Uh, what are some avenues for that? Well, the first thing you should do is find my web page and my phone number and email and call me uh, or somebody who knows what's up. And I could recommend others um, because it, it depends on the state. So some states actually follow DEA and they just don't realize what's happened at DEA or they don't believe it or the, you know, the, the regulators just haven't been asked to change the law. Others might be willing to change the law on seeds if somebody would just ask them. And I can't tell you specifically in any particular state, you know, off the top of my head, but I can tell you generally that the way that it works is you you know, if there's a often the way that it works is that the state legislature will pass a broad law and then delegate authority to a regulator to implement that law and fill in the details. And that will generally give uh, stakeholders an opportunity to propose a rule if they want to say, hey, agency, you should change your law because DEA did this or whatever your reasons might be. Um, another way to change it would be to uh, go do what many people are planning to do in the chat, it looks like, and take all kinds of incredibly risky uh, projects on that I would never undertake personally, uh, but more power to you. Um, and those people might find that they run into problems with various regulators or law enforcement entities. Maybe not, maybe. If they do, then you can challenge it that way, right? Through judicial review. The other way is the good old fashioned uh, voting and you know lobbying and grassroots uh, type activity. Um, another way would be to develop, uh, I've talked with many people about this, you know, developing um, uh, an industry group, an organization that represents the interests of seed growers, sellers, genetics, whatever it might be, and do it across state, uh, state, state lines and start talking about this and finding experts in the field to be able to help you with that. Finally, I guess the last one, um, you know, that, that I'll say is, you know, if, well, you could even do very, very exotic things like start a state, a private public partnership between a state and your organization to propose federal reforms or state reforms, vice versa. Just, I mean, there are all kinds of opportunities and things that you could do from very big to very small. And it's up to you how important it is. And, you know, like I said, holler at your boy and, uh, or I will, direct, I, you know, if I don't know how to answer your question, I can certainly point you to somebody who does. Absolutely. Yes. And we can certainly uh, make connections after the fact. Um, and uh, and if, if folks in the panel want to share contact information, please feel free to do so. Uh, we'll have a log of all the, the chats that we can make connections after this webinar. One of the, or another question that's received a, a few variations from audience members has to do with um, the international market, as it were. And maybe this uh, this touches on, on the treaty, Shane, but um, we have folks asking about um, the shipment of seeds uh, across national borders, uh, and at least in some of the examples from the audience, uh, these are mostly European countries, it sounds like, although I know we have a, a wide variety of, uh, of geographies in the audience. Uh, I guess we could, this could probably be a whole other conversation, I suppose, it gets into a lot of other legal territory, but, but are there anything, are there things that international growers should know about sourcing seeds from the U.S.? or that breeders should know about selling seeds across, across those national borders. Um, and, and, and if this is going off in a, in a different tangent, we could certainly take the conversation offline with, with the folks who are asking, but, but I, I'd be curious um, what the international situation looks like. I mean, I'm looking at this for a bunch of clients, not a bunch, but a few different clients uh, with specific um, questions along these lines. And I can tell you, I've looked at it to and from various different countries. And suffice to say, there are at least two different federal agencies with relevant regulations that you would need to look at and understand. And then you need to look at the laws in place in the country that you're going to or from. And there's usually some level of coordination involved. That said, there are also people just doing this, right? And like, so I'm constantly getting that question from clients like, well, aren't people just doing this? It's like, yeah, but, you know, there's a risk there. And um, I, I guess I would just tell everybody on this call, like, you know, I don't sell seeds. I'm not I don't sell cannabis. I, I'm a lawyer. Right. Um, but I will tell you, just as somebody who 
works in this industry uh, and sees a lot of it, my general advice would be everyone needs to start thinking very carefully about not just their own immediate business interests, but also balancing that against the risk of creating bad precedent and sort of the, the unintended ramifications that like one entity might do something that could create, have a rippling effects out for others, right? Now, of course you have no, I'm not telling you to be altruistic or, or telling you how to set your priorities. I'm just saying that there's a reason why most industries have like organizations that, that coordinate their interests and represent them in, in front of various regulators. When everybody runs in a thousand different directions, you know, confusion abounds and that ends up benefiting no one. So I think that people should be starting to get now as we're moving toward more uh, federal uh, reform and people should, you know, folks who have businesses should start getting plugged in and, and kind of thinking about how, yeah, we're competitors, me and you uh, out there in the market, but maybe when it comes to the regulations that govern us, we should start working together more. Um, just a tip from somebody who's worked in a lot of different industries. Absolutely. I want to um, refer to a question here that, uh, that I know, Shane, you, you touched on already, at least um, in, in, with a written response. Um, but just, just in the event that audience members are, are spending time on Google searching things like DEA and official determination, um, it does appear that the DEA had issued sort of a follow-up official determination just a few weeks ago in, in December, which sort of uh, continues its response to your letter about a year ago, and then adds a line about seeds germinating in the material having a, a THC concentration of more than 0.3%. Um, I don't know if, I mean, we could quote it further, but I don't know if you want to clarify that, um, just in the event that people are searching and stumbling upon this more recent DEA letter. Sure. So I haven't actually seen the letter my, myself yet, um, but what the quoted language said, you know, on my first read seems absolutely correct. I mean, you have a definition of marijuana in the Controlled Substances Act. It's 21 U.S.C. 802.16, and it's a complex definition, all right? And it has lots of specific exemptions. One of them is hemp. There are others for mature stalks, fiber, like various things, okay? Then you have the hemp exclusion, which is separate. So if the stuff that this person is referring to or, or that language refers to is below the 0.3% threshold, then it's hemp. If it's above the 0.3% threshold, it is, it is marijuana under federal law and therefore a Schedule One substance unless it falls in one of the other statutory exemptions in 802.16. If you need more advice than that, you're gonna have to, uh, again, ask somebody to drill down in it a, a lot further. Absolutely. Um, uh, you know, um, I know we, we've got about 15 minutes left here on this panel. One quick note, we did lose Rick. Uh, we are working on getting him back just for the end of this panel, just in case people are wondering. And if they have questions specific for Rick, we can certainly make connections. Um, but uh, one of the questions here relates to, um, and this may be a little far afield, and I know, Shane, it sounds like your colleague on the, uh, the Substack, Matt Zorn, uh, may be someone who uh, it'd be interesting to talk to about this. Um, we have a lot of questions about plant utility patents. Um, and in the interest of rolling them up into one question, given everything we've talked about, given the DEA stance, um, where, what's the status, I suppose, of, of patenting cannabis genetics. And again, this is another thing that, that could turn into a whole different hour and a half long webinar. Um, but in the context here, um, is there anything that, that growers should know um, about the patenting process or where it stands right now? Matt Zorn is the guy to ask. This one I do not know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we've got a few questions out there and we can certainly make connections uh, with, with those folks. Um, a few people were asking about existing case law that might be interesting to read about. I don't know if uh, if Jay or Shane, if you want to cite anything or even provide links, and maybe you have already uh, in, a, in a few instances, but are there any examples of, of state case law that might be interesting for folks to read up uh, in their spare time? Well, that First Circuit case I referred to earlier is the most important federal case, I think, affecting the industry in, in a few years. And it, now it's, I don't know, you have to, it's, it's really 
uh, deep in, in the law. It's really, uh, it's, it, so if you enjoy that sort of uh, legal uh, uh, argumentation, uh, that would be an interesting uh, thing to read. Uh, and, and especially because there's a dissent. So, so you have two very you know, clear views about the Dormant Commerce Clause uh, and whether or, and how it applies. I guess we can find, get a link to it. Um, uh, I'll, I'll work on that unless we have it already somewhere. Um, Certainly, yeah, I can, um, yeah, if you're tracking down a link, that'd be great to place in the chat for everybody, yeah. just for a bit of background reading here. Um, I want to address this question just, uh, just while we're here to clear up any misconceptions. One of our audience members is asking, and I'll just quote, to recap, it sounds like while the transport of seed across the U.S. is legal, the production of that seed must be done via a state-regulated marijuana program. And I'll just pause there. Um, that these seeds can, they don't necessarily need to come from state regulated cannabis programs, correct? No, and I, I, I mean, I, I don't think it's necessary, like the, to say something is legal, full stop is very, very difficult in this area because there are so many regimes of law that no one is currently like right now looking at in front of them. Um, they change all the time. And so it's very difficult. I mean, all that the, the letter means is that DEA, one federal agency, has made an official determination under authority delegated by Congress that these seeds are not controlled under one statute. So, for example, if you marketed seeds as a drug in interstate commerce, you'd be violating the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, right? If you sell seeds across state lines in various ways, you might run afoul of, of various federal regulations, state laws, you know, it, it's it's not that simple, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, one question here, uh, just while I'm going through uh, the, uh, a ton of fantastic questions from folks. Um, there is one about tribal sovereignty. Um, is that, uh, Perhaps a shield in some ways uh, from from the federal government's stance on this, and and we could get into retail sales of cannabis or or the growing of cannabis uh, on on tribal lands. Um, but Shane or Jay, would you want to address that question of of tribal sovereignty when uh, when relating to the, the U.S. federal government's position on this? Uh, I I taught uh, uh, Native American law once many years ago, and if there's there's one thing that's more complicated uh, than than cannabis law. That might be it. It's uh, and so to put them together. I, I I know I've known a little bit about this here and there in the past, and I've had students write papers, but I don't feel confident that uh, that I can provide any sort of useful or concise comment on it. It is very important and interesting, though. I don't know. Absolutely. Um... Tom, this, this question may be for you. We've gotten a couple of versions of this actually. Um, and again, I'll just quote this directly. If seeds are created from flowering cannabis plants, which are tagged in metric, at least in state programs, I suppose, um, should, can this, should the seeds be allowed to then be removed from metric uh, or never put into metric in the first place? This may be a bit of a rhetorical question, but, but Tom, what kind of uh, seed to sale tracking issues have you run up against uh, with your buyers? So I haven't actually had any challenges or any uh, hurdles in that department. We are just kind of forming as much of our own path as we can, trying to think about every aspect uh, in conjunction with our legal department. Um, you know, we spent a long time planning this and getting the proper advice. Uh, as Shane has mentioned numerous times, you know, uh, have legal representation, you know, ask lots of questions. This is all uncharted territory. So for us, we don't really necessarily have a specific uh, plan to follow. We're just kind of doing what we think should be best since there is no system in place here in Illinois yet for, you know, our model. Um, we can't seem to find much guidance. Uh, nobody on a, you know, on a over-the-counter retail level is asking any of those questions at this state. They're just happy to have a a home to come buy genetics from that other than online, other than, you know, questionable places. So for us, uh, it's about just maintaining as, as much proper uh, tracking as we can. So like, I don't purchase from anybody that's, you know, doesn't have a licensed facility if they're the breeder. I don't purchase if it doesn't come with 
test results and COAs and nobody's told me I need that specifically, we're choosing to do it to kind of hopefully form, you know, form this new network for Illinois. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to start circling around to some summaries or some overall takeaways uh, as we near the end of this presentation. But there is an interesting question here that, that Tom, I know you addressed in, in written form. Um, and it's sort of an interesting line of thinking. Uh, this, this audience member is asking about um, maybe a fear of home grow becoming more prevalent. And certainly some states don't allow home grow, um, but certainly a lot of what we've been talking about today intersects with home growers um, needs and, and what they want to buy in the market. Um, could you just talk a bit about that? I know, Tom, you, you answered the question already with this particular audience member, but could you place, you know, a lot of our audience is, is licensed growers today, and, and certainly some of them are unlicensed growers as well, too. But could you um, talk about the intersection of that and, and the role that, that home grow is playing in this, this broader conversation? Yeah, I, I think, you know, I've been cultivating for a long time, you know, so going on, you know, around that 30 year mark here. And most cultivators are very passionate and they're few and far between. It's not necessarily an easy process to finish a, a grow with a product that's going to be comparable to, you know, have that bag appeal, the proper, you know, everything that everybody's looking for. And so a lot of people will dabble in it and try. And a lot of people will find, I think the majority will find that they'd rather go to a dispensary and buy something so long as the price was reasonable, the quality was good, and then more importantly, that it has a background, you know, a line of genetics from a breeder or a particular cultivator that, uh, that they're willing to spend the money on. And I compare it to, you know, when prohibition was lifted, I think as those laws changed, I think there was still a lot of people making gin in the bathtub and brewing things at home. And over the course of legalization and some time, though, that all balanced out. I, I don't know too many people that brew at home anymore compared to buying their beer and their liquor at a store. And I personally you know, feel the same as obtainable for the cannabis industry. So if I was speaking to all the other licensed cultivators. I would say authenticity is everything. Genetics are everything. It's, it's the fundamentals. Me and Rick were talking about this before the call. You could have the best cultivation center and everything perfectly lined up, but if you don't have the right genetics in there, it's, it's not going to equate to the right sales. People are not going to be happy with it, and it's and that's where you, that's where you're going to see the losses, in my opinion. So, I think uh, cultivators should be not concerned on the home grower. I think they should be more concerned with forming the proper channels and networks and getting the right genetics for their region, for their for their cultivation center to meet their needs and proper crop rotations to you know rotate these out you know you got to get the proper things onto the shelves of the dispensaries if we want the industry to lower prices and to you know settle down and less black market i think once all the black market's gone the home growers are gonna probably be responsible for you know maybe five percent compared to the other 95 percent that are going to be happy to shop in a store certainly yeah and i think just a bunch of important ideas there uh as a backdrop to what is proving to be a very challenging year in, in the licensed cannabis space in 2023 thus far. So some, some good thoughts there. Um, before I go around the horn here and, and touch on some, some final thoughts for the audience, just two quick notes. One, uh, we, Rick did lose uh, internet connection at his place, so he, he will not be uh, wrapping up the event with us. But if anyone has Rick specific questions, we'll make those connections later. We were very pleased to have him here while he was. And lastly, a bunch of people have asked about uh, being able to watch this video after the fact. We will be sharing a link to this, this full video with everyone in the audience via email in the coming days, and it'll be on CannabisBusinessTimes.com. Um, but with the, the few minutes remaining, uh, we're going until 3.30 Eastern here. Um, Jay, maybe we can begin with you. Um, I know we've covered a lot already, uh, so maybe uh, concise summaries aren't the simplest thing right now, but what is, what's one or two takeaways that you might suggest to the audience or something that, that you might want to part with? Um, I suppose uh, to, to just sort of uh, hit on a couple of things that I've said already and, and summarize it quickly, I think this is, it's an interesting, uh, one of the million things that are it's interesting about cannabis, uh, cannabis law is that it, it, it looks like it's it's possible that we won't that that it won't evolve through through federal legislation like we thought, uh, and uh, and it might in fact be 
at the judicial level, the court level, that spurs the real significant change. Uh, if if, if there, these cases on dormant commerce clause are super important to follow because if they come out the way they probably should come out, it's that's going to have an immediate or fairly immediate effect on the industry, and that is going to affect how the federal government uh, uh, thinks about cannabis. I, it would be it'll be interesting to see if the federal government ever you know responds to changes in the law that come from the court. So that's, uh, that's, that's, uh, and I think that's a somewhat of a new dynamic in cannabis law that's, that's interesting to look at. Absolutely. Um, Tom, from, from your perspective, uh, in Chicago, uh, with, a, with a brick and mortar setting for a lot of, a lot of the dynamics we're talking about here, um, what should folks be thinking about? Maybe, maybe direct. I mean, I, I suppose you kind of got into this with your last answer, but as a as a final takeaway for for growers and, and buyers of seeds, what should they be thinking about? Um, I, you know, I, I would be thinking about we're we're about education, right? We're not. I'm not looking to push sales into people. I don't want people to take things home and have bad uh, experiences. I want everybody to have the most successful experiences they can. So doing the research and knowing the laws, you know, coming in here with as much knowledge as possible is always best. But outside of that, you know, uh, you know, do, uh, do the, do your homework is what I pretty much tell all my growers, you know, right now, Illinois allows you to grow five plants with a medical card. So that's kind of our biggest thing is, you know, not directing people to break any laws. We want to kind of be an, you know, an icon for proper education. Uh, the whole, concept of loophole and gray area is something that uh, we want no part of. We, we, we don't want people, you know, just running purely on those numbers and doing things the wrong way because it's just backtracking and making it tougher. And that's what seems to, you know, add more regulation into the system, whereas we're looking to get this, you know, more of an acceptable, relaxed situation for, you know, for something that's so medicinal for a plant. So, uh, I can really tell you though, we've been surprised. We've had everything from the 82 year old woman up the street that lives in a retirement building that's looking for auto flower seeds to put on her balcony this spring for uh, CBD and THC strains all the way to the 18 year old with their medical card that's treating Crohn's disease and is looking for uh, you know, more sustainable solutions for their health. So the spectrum has been really wide. It's been uh, pretty accepting. Everybody in our neighborhood in the city is a, uh, Seems to be happy to have us here, so uh, you know we're excited. Yeah, a little microcosm of of the industry and, and the history of the plant in general, um, or the recent history, recent history at least. Um, Shane, I wanted to to end with you, and and one thing that I noticed as we were talking is not a, not only among the panel, the panelists, but certainly among the audience members as well. It seems like everybody's got a reference point for the letter that you received from the DEA. Everybody has their own little story of of the DEA Shane Pennington letter. Um, which is just an interesting, uh, I suppose, reputation that, that's been built up over the last 12 months. Um, so I don't know if you want to remark on that and, and the role that letter has played that and has brought us to this conversation today or, or just some, some final takeaways in general. But, but I do want to just note that, um, you know, it is an important document. It is an important thing that, that you did not only to, to draw out that language from the DEA, but, but to ensure that it's, it's been shared widely and, and um, you know, I think conversations like this are super important, and uh, I'm glad that, that most of the audience seemed familiar with the letter, first of all, uh, but also willing to engage it critically and, and ask questions. So just wanted to say that. But anyway, Shane, uh, last thoughts for the audience here? Yeah. Um, thanks. Thanks for saying all that. And um, I think the questions are great. I mean, um, I was answering them as fast as I could until I started to get early onset arthritis and then just sort of gave up. But um, I guess that the lessons I've learned from this seed letter thing, I mean, it was super easy to get that determination. I mean, it's literally incredibly simple. Um, it's on the website. You don't even need a law degree. Like anybody could do that. And I think that what it shows you is like, I'm sitting here, you know, with this fancy law degree and, and, you know, a resume I worked hard for and all these like crazy ideas to change the world. Um, and I just would tell everyone that there are lots of things that are possible, right? If you engage in the administrative process, in litigation, in lobbying, um, there are there are ways to to move the boulder up and over the mountain, to move the mountain 
to go under around through the mountain anything you know uh if i just feel like people aren't really people don't don't really believe anything's possible because of how intractable you know the federal abs the absurd aspects of federal policy have been for a long time but we've done a lot more than just this seed letter i mean we've like knocked down the night of monopoly and we've you know we're we're on the verge of doing many other i think pretty important things and so are other people some of them i've seen in the comments have written some really great stuff and so i would just encourage you you know to think big and um if there's a problem talk to problem solvers absolutely great thoughts there um you know, I do want to say uh, just briefly, as, as, as Shane mentioned, the NIDA monopoly, which is an interesting thing that as we're up against the clock here. So I, I suppose it's a, it's a different conversation, but, but please do search that and know that Dr. Sue Sisley, who, who played a pivotal role in that alongside Shane and, and his, his colleagues, uh, was a keynote speaker at Cannabis Conference not too long ago. And so I do want to just plug once more, you know, if you liked the tone of this conversation, if you liked the back and forth that we were at least attempting to have in, in the chat and in the, in the Q&A, it did pile up quite quickly. Um, we will be continuing this thread at Cannabis Conference in August. It's August 15th, August 15th to the 17th, sorry about that, uh, at CannabisConference.com. We'll be out in Las Vegas. And, uh, and please use the code SEEDS, S-E-E-D-S, for 10% off your registration Registration goes live tomorrow on the 2nd. But beyond that, I really want to thank everybody in the audience for joining us today. This is a fantastic conversation. Um, on some level, we just scratched the surface. On, on another level, I think we got pretty deep here, and I, I hope we offered some clarity. Uh, but it's the conversation is far from over. Uh, so please you know, reach out to us at Cannabis Business Times. Reach out to the panelists. We're going to keep this going into 2023 and beyond. There's a lot of work to be done for sure. So thank you all for being here. Lastly, I want to thank uh, certainly Rick and his team. I know some of his team members are online here, but, but thanks to Rick and thanks to Jay and Tom and Shane for joining us on this panel. Really appreciate your time and, and insight. This was, this was awesome. Thanks everybody. Thanks Eric. Thank you. Thank you. Thank appreciate you. everybody's time.